Hello, Joanne. Ah, you, you've muted yourself. Hi, Glenn. Hi. Hi, Hi Joe. Hear you, John. You, you, Here you we muted. go. Ah, oh, there we go. A little bit better. Right. Fiona's in the waiting room. Fiona McLeod. Should I let her in, David? Or? Yeah, Fiona. Yeah, sure. Cool. Incoming. I'm going to, if other people arrive, I'm going to keep them in the waiting room um, until we start. Sure. If we're, if we're talking logistics now. Yes, I think that's that makes sense. Lelek is there. I'll let her in. And I have been in touch with Leone and Tando this morning, so hopefully we're all on track. <clears throat> David, if I make you a co-host, you should be able to see the waiting room and then you can let people in um, okay. if they need to be um, because I'm not, don't, you might know them better than me, but I'm just leaving everyone I don't know in the waiting room. Morning, Leonie. Hi. And I'm going to make all the speakers <laughs> co-hosts. Is that right? Great. That's fine. Uh, yes. I'm going to just get my headphones. Um, <clears throat> let me just check through the controls here so I can see what's going on. Okay, it's how we can mute people. Um, okay, morning, Tando. Um, I'm going to try for the meantime just sharing my slides to ensure that I still know how to do that in Zoom. <laughs> um, there we go. Are my slides coming up? Yep, you can see them well. Great. Um, so I can probably leave this up, is that right? Absolutely. If, they, yeah, if you want to have that as a sort of holding the slide in the meantime, that's cool. Okay. David, I don't know if you want to drop the link to the guide in the chat while we're sort of introducing people or as we're getting started, or whether you want to rather do that later. Um, I think let's do, well, we'll let, we can do that. Um, let's, yeah, let's do that right now. Well, people only see it after the, if you drop it in before they join, they won't see it. So maybe once. Oh, okay, you know, right. Or on. On the call once we're getting started. The only will be you be using slides. Oh. No. No. Okay. Great. That always simplifies things. David, do we have a timekeeper? Because you'll probably be quite involved in all the speaking. Yeah, and Glenn will be keeping track of people's times. Thanks. Um, I think, Glenn, if people look like they're going to, we can give people a bit of leeway up to six 
minutes or so, but seven tops for those who, who've brief, been briefed for five minutes. The only you're on mute if you're speaking. <laughs> I wasn't, but yeah, that, that's fine. I will come in quite, yeah, I'll just interrupt you. So apologies yeah, in advance great. if I do interrupt you, but that's what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, can see the people in the waiting room, which is great. Michelle, hi, good morning. Um, Glenn, do your powers extend to making Michelle a, a co-host as well? You're on mute, Glenn. I can, and you should be able to as well now. Um, um, okay. I've, I've made her one. Right, I can. S I don't seem to be able to make add other people make other people co-hosts. Oh, okay. But, yeah, but great. Thank you. Um. Will people automatically be admitted at 10 or do we need to admit everyone? We can just admit everyone, I guess. Yeah, we can just yeah. click admit all and get going. Great. Um, I'll let Stephen in now. I'm just thinking um, it might be a good idea to have the live transcription on uh, just so I can have some notes to refer back to. Um, yeah, is that something you know how to yeah, I've, set? Yeah, I've requested it because um, I, I, ah, it's on. Thank you. Oh, great. Lovely to see you again, Joe. Sorry, I muted myself because there was a bit of background noise, but I said, lovely to see you too, Michelle. <laughs> I thought as much. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I'm recording, it's recording already, David, it started automatically. I see. Obviously, it okay. to take out these first bits, but people will get a message as they join saying it's being it's recorded. recorded. Great. Just say okay to that, so that's all happening. Okay. Ready to go when you are. Okay. I'm just going to wait until the, the dot of 11 and then admit everyone who's waiting. Okay. Let's give people a couple more seconds to join. And will you keep admitting them after 11 as well, David? Yes. Michelle, could I ask you for help with that? Yes, yes. Um, Great. I'm happy to do that. So Great. Thank just, you. Yeah, I'll do all okay. that stuff. We'll admit everyone else right now. So. Okay, I think Glenn, let's give it let's give it half a minute and then let everyone else in and then get going. Morning everyone. As Dave, you've heard from David, we're just gonna give it a little bit longer for people to join. There's still people coming in, and then we'll get going. 
It's good to have you with us. Okay, it's a minute past, so we'll get going with some pleasantries and then hopefully by the time we get into the um, real part of the presentations this morning, everyone will be in the room with us. So thank you for all of you who've um, joined us. We're really grateful to having you here today for this launch of the, of the media guide from Fossil Free South Africa. My name is Glenn Tyler Davies. I'm the South African team leader for 350africa.org. And um, David from Fossil Free South Africa has asked me to moderate today. So I'll be with you um, throughout the course of events over the next hour. We'd like you to ask you to turn on your cameras um, if you're able to at the beginning, just for these introductions, just so we can see who else is on the call um, and get a sense for who is in the room virtually. And we'd also like you to introduce yourself in the chat if possible. So if you could please put your names and affiliations in the chat, that would be a great um, start. Again, just so we know who's in the room um, and have a sense of who's with us today. So you can do that, just your name and affiliation in the chat, that would be great. We are recording the event and when you joined, you should have got a, a click uh, through that you had to do to say that we're recording it. So just to uh, let you know that we are recording it, that's primarily for our own records. Um, we will put parts of the um, session today online, but mostly just the individual speaker presentations. Um, so that will what that's what we're primarily recording for. Just at the at the start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, event and what we'll be going through today. Um, and thank you for those of you who are already um, putting your names and affiliations in the chat. For those of you that are still joining, please continue to put your name and affiliation in the chat so we've got a sense of who's with us today. Once we're done with these brief introductions, I'm going to hand over to Tan, uh, Tando Lukuko, um, who will be offering a civil society perspective on climate change in the media and the media briefing. Then to David LePage of Fossil Free South Africa, who will outline the context of the climate reporting guide and briefly, briefly run through the guide itself. We'll then hear from Lulek Kadlamini of the University of Cape Town Climate Lab, um, who will address the emerging methane crisis, something that I think we've all heard a lot about, anybody who's paying attention to climate change. Then we'll turn to Leonie Joubert, who will be talking about the role of narrative journalism in climate reporting. And then finally, Joanne Smetherin of Fossil Free South Africa will make a few remarks about the development of the guide itself. We will have some time at the end for questions and answers. So we'll ask you to please keep your questions until the end of the session, until all the speakers have spoken. Um, and we'll have time then to ask individual speakers their questions, but we won't pause in between the presentations. We're aiming to wrap up the meeting at 11.55. Um, however, you will be welcome to stay on. And if you have further questions or any other points you'd like to discuss uh, following the end of the call, you're welcome to do that. So with that said, just for those who've arrived while I've been giving an introduction, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name and affiliation. We're going to kick off and speakers, I will try and keep you to time as much as possible. I'm going to start by introducing Tando Lukuko, the Network Node Coordinator for the South African Climate Action Network. SA CAN is part of the Climate Action Network, a worldwide network of over 1,300 NGOs in over 130 countries. Tando, if I can hand over to you now. Uh, thanks, Glenn. Could you please confirm if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you all. Go ahead. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you to the organizers for um, giving me an opportunity. And then thank you as well for everyone for joining us. As Glenn has said, my name is Tano Lukuko. I'm the coordinator of SA CAN for short. Um, and really, uh, my, my input, as, as, as it is outlined, is just, just on the status, I guess, of climate change and climate change reporting in South Africa from a civil society perspective. And really, I think from uh, straight off the blocks, we could say 
there's certainly a lot more climate change reporting happening in more frequently and more recently than there has been over the last few years and decades. And, and that has to be commended. Um, and, and so for that, we, we appreciate it. Um, and the, one of the things about climate change, I think that, 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 that we're quickly learning is that um, number one, it's such a rapidly changing environment that, that even the stories that are emerging, you know, um, for instance, if you look at what happened in KZN, very quickly, we, we're seeing how other impacts uh, in other parts of the world are emerging, including in South Africa as well, like for instance, the droughts. What um, we don't see happen uh, enough uh, is trying to get a proper understanding or clear understanding of, of what, at least from a factual perspective, what, what, what is happening um, and also what is, uh, how it relates to particularly uh, the communities that are impacted by this, how civil society um, is, 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 is working with those most impacted to try and uh, alleviate some of those challenges um, as compared to then a, 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 what's called a, a business as usual type of case. Now, from, from our perspective, um, if we take some very, very specific examples, uh, this week there was a, a story which came out, uh, I, I'm not going to mention any uh, uh, specific publications, but just to say there was a briefing that came out um, from one of our colleagues uh, in, in the business unity, and it spoke about the, the carbon tax issue. Um, when we then later looked at, uh, some days later, we looked at uh, a recourse which was published by, by colleagues from civil society, uh, the business one was on the front page, but yet the civil society piece was um, in the um, page six or seven or something like that in, in, in the paper, which kind of uh, gives this indication that you know certain voices are more important in the discourse of climate change than others, which I think is is, is very much erroneous. And part of what we're excited about about uh, this exercise that Fossil Free is taking us through is there's there's outside of just the information of climate change, but um, there are stories, there are um, examples of things that organizations specifically are doing that uh, provide a different perspective to what, for instance, is is. Uh, either business perspective or the, the dominate the dominant narrative and so for us it's then how can we make uh the reporting of of or how rather can we encourage the reporting of climate change news to be more people-centric specifically to those that are most impacted um and that doesn't matter from where what background the person comes from because climate change is a great equalizer and so yeah there, there, there isn't a lot i don't have a great deal of time but just to say the last thing for us outside of then just making sure that the stories are, are, are captured correctly is then also to say, um, you know, there's 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 uh, communities, there are people that are doing quite a great deal of good work out there that their stories might not be as palatable, might not be as um, juicy, if you, if I can use those terms, as some other stories, because I've, I've come to understand, I mean, I'm not a media person, but I understand a little bit that certain stories sell uh, more than others. And, and really what we're trying to do is trying to move the needle from the stories which are, are on the extreme right of what is um, considered uh, newsworthy and move that line a little bit more to the center so that we can get a wider girth of stories that are more impacted by climate change and, and make it more appealing to the everyday person. Um, so, so this would be um, what we would share as, as some touch points. Uh, and then also always just 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 referring back to and I'm, I've seen it happening more and more frequently. Always referring back to the organisations uh, such as 350, such as Fossil Free, such as SECAN, who are the uh, knowledgeable um, ones in, in the space outside of just uh, those from business and the private sector specifically. Uh, yeah, I think I think let me end there for now uh, for the sake of time. But I shall remain on for for any questions if there will be. Uh, thanks, Len. Thanks, David. Thanks very much, Tando. And if you've just joined us, if you wouldn't mind dropping your name and affiliation in the chat, that would be great. Thank you for those of you who have already. I'm going to hand over now to David from Fossil Free South Africa. David, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm David LePage. I'm the coordinator of Fossil Free South Africa, as, you, as you've heard. Thanks very much for joining us today. It's great to have so many people in, in this meeting, and uh, we hope that you'll find it interesting and, and worthwhile use of your time. 
A brief introduction to Fossil Free South Africa. We're a campaign for fossil fuel divestment. We've been going for nine years. Our work really grew out of a campaign to persuade the University of Cape Town to commit to divestment, which they did in March, March this year. We also had an Invest Fossil Free campaign targeting SA's top asset managers, asking them to offer um, their clients fossil fuel free funds. We have an exciting new program, Clean Creatives SA, which is asking ad and PR people to pledge not to work for the fossil fuel industry anymore. In other words, not to participate in the great greenwashing exercise. Um, and now we're introducing this climate reporting guide, which is an effort to make a positive contribution to um, what has sometimes been quite a critical voice against media. So we're not going to go into in depth on sources and references and so forth, but we have all those sources and references if you need them, and we're very happy to share them. Um, so please um, do, don't hesitate to ask. And many of the, the references for the presentation I'm making now are in the guide. So this is a picture of a landslide, um, and I'm really using it as a way of introducing the, the, the predicament that we're in. A landslide, you throw a boulder down a, mo a mountain and sometimes that boulder doesn't knock anything else out of the way and it just bounces away fairly harmlessly. But other times you throw a rock down a mountain and it starts off a whole lot of other rocks and causes a whole lot of mounting problems. And I want to use that as a way of, that metaphor as a way of introducing this particular story which ran last week on The Guardian. It would have been the, the top headline had the Queen not died that day. And this is an example of the kind of story I think we really need to see um, in the South African media more often. It might read initially like a sort of weird, obscure science story, but it's a story that has a very profound set of implications for humanity um, and which about the changes that will be with us long past the Queen and all her successors. So, and really the key points that came out of the story are that tipping points, which are natural systems that are destabilized by the human influence on the climate, are starting to, to threaten to be uh, triggered. And these include the, the collapse of Greenland's ice cap, which would eventually produce huge amounts of sea level rise, the collapse of key currents in the North Atlantic Ocean, which produce a stable climate for much of Northern Europe and uh, Northern European agriculture, and another tipping, potential tipping point is the melting of carbon-rich permafrost in the, in the Arctic. And what that means is that carbon, which has been locked away naturally in the permafrost, will then be released in addition to the human contribution to, to climate change, um, accelerating the climate, climate crisis. This is what these predictions mean for, for Europe. This is a UK Met Office um, chart the the yellow line that you see there are their predictions from 2003 for temperature change in europe and on what the black line is is the actual observed temperatures so you can see that those predictions have been very very solid indeed um, so this is a very fast growing crisis climate change is coming at us very very fast it's not something linear and orderly and predictable quite the contrary these are how these changes are unfolding in South Africa. And at the moment on current emissions and temperature trends, we're on track to warm by five to six degrees in the century in, in many regions. So I invite you to imagine how this graph would unfold in South Africa for it followed the similar trends to those in Europe. And unfortunately, the, the warming trend in South Africa is much steeper. So governments aren't obviously acting nearly fast enough to address to arrest this climate crisis. Why is that? I think part of the problem is a, a democratic disconnect. So many of our major economies, such as the US, the UK, South Africa, are, off, are flawed or close to flawed democracies in which the voice of the people often doesn't turn into to policy. We often have ignorance of the, the modern reality of uneconomic growth, that many of the ways in which we're growing economically are actually doing more damage um, then they are bringing benefits. We have policy makers who are often ignorant of climate change and can't imagine a world without fossil fuels, which, and we have a lack of appreciation for the alternatives to the use of fossil fuels. And then, of course, the focus of our, our divestment campaign, there is very widespread denial and corruption directly funded by, by fossil fuel companies. And in South Africa, we have, this amounts to a widespread public ignorance of 
the nature of the climate crisis. So we can see this in, in, the, in the gulf between two reports, you know, the, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report 2021. Respondents to that report, global policymakers and key business people overwhelmingly rank climate action failure as being the leading risk facing the world over a two to 10 year time horizon. But in South Africa, only 20% of South Africans even understand that the climate crisis is being caused by human action. So as the UN Secretary General says, we seem to be trapped in a world where fossil fuel producers and companies have humanity by the throat. For decades, the fossil fuel industry invested heavily in pseudoscience and public relations with a false narrative to minimize their responsibility for climate change. Because of course, the emissions from the fossil fuel industry remain the leading sort of cause of, of global climate change. So this all adds up to some key myths and assumptions that I think are pervasive in South Africa. For example, the idea that protecting the environment is an expensive luxury, whereas the environment is in fact the only real foundation for our economy and for our society. The myth that climate change will be slow and predictable and we still have time to fix it. Unfortunately, as I've mentioned, it's disorderly and accelerating and to fix it or to at least slow it to the degree that we need to, we need to have very dramatic emissions cuts of greenhouse gases of 50% by 2030. Another myth is the, the not a necessarily a myth, but a, a kind of distorted assumption is this notion of net zero by 2050. Unfortunately, a lot of the net zero plans put out real emissions cuts far too late. And as I've just mentioned, we need to have those emissions cuts in those decade in this decade. And if we get that 50%, then the, the, the rest will largely take care of it itself. And then in South Africa, I think another key myth is the, the idea that our people are poor and which of course many people are and they, they need the jobs from the fossil fuel industry. Unfortunately, the emissions of the fossil fuel industry also destroyed jobs around the world. We're talking about an extractive economic model that has been failing us for, for far too long in South Africa and it's not going to suddenly fix our very real problems of poverty and inequality now. Um, and then another key myth, I think, is the idea that developing countries can act later, that there's some benefit to still sticking with, with fossil fuels, that, that that time is now past as well. Unfortunately, despite their rhetoric, the world's largest oil and gas companies are failing to back their words and pledges on climate change, and they're still spending an enormous amount of money on lobbying and dis distorting the climate debate. Um, to go back to the damage that's caused by, by fossil fuels, just to give one example very close to home, Sasol, if you look at the social cost of carbon, that's the damage done by a single ton of carbon when added to the atmosphere. The gulf between Sasol's earnings is absolutely, and the, the amount of damage done by their emissions is absolutely staggering. So in 2018, for example, we see they had 10 billion in earnings and did three trillion damage rands, three trillion rands worth of um, damage to the global climate. These numbers are almost impossible to believe, but they are, are they are well founded. So the guide that I'm going to run through in a moment was written by myself and my colleague Joanne Smitherum. We are journalists who have worked in South Africa for a combined 40 years. We intend this to make a, a constructive and helpful contribution to human rights journalism, really. Um, and that says which should bring us back to the, our responsibilities in the media are, should refer always, I think, to our National Bill of Rights and the right to have an environment that is not harmful to our health and or well-being and that is preserved for future generations. I think another touchstone for us in this work should be the, the, the South African Press Code of Conduct, um, which says that the media exists to serve society that news should be presented in context and without material emissions um, to make some key points from that code relating to this work. So getting climate journalism right, I think, is a balance of, a, of some four key factors. Firstly, having accurate content that reflect the facts and qualified expert opinion, having accurate context, ensuring that the climate issue is, re is reported in, in stories on, on natural disasters, in stories on agriculture and fossil fuels, for example, wherever there is a potential role for climate, even if we don't necessarily understand exactly what that role is, um, that role should be noted. We need appropriate editorial presentation 
all too often still climate stories are reported on, which is great, uh, but then they're pushed into particular silos, put away in environment sections and don't nearly often enough make it into the headlines. And then is there enough content? Um, I think Extinction Rebellion um, with a protest earlier in the CEO captured that issue in the slogan, climate news every day. Um, so I'm gonna move now to the climate reporting guide itself and run you through that very quickly. Um, we start with an introduction talking about why, what and why South Africans need to know about the climate crisis. Can everybody see this, by the way? No, David, we just see a blank okay. screen at the moment. Okay, that's, let me check that that. Um, fix that. I think, you, I think you just to, have uh, to. I think you just have to no. click on a different browser window. Um, yes. Sorry, then we're just going to. I need to stop. Maybe we should see the presentation fine. Yeah, if you okay. start sharing again, it should work. Just start sharing again. Um, okay. Can we see that now? Yeah, that's good. Great. Apologies for that. So we talk about what South Africans need to know about the climate crisis, the problems and the opportunities, the causes of climate change. I think all too many people don't know the, the basic mechanisms of climate change yet. We talk about the climate crisis in South Africa, the particular impacts that we're seeing here. And we talk about our South African climate energy challenge, the challenge that comes with being one of the world's most fossil fuel intensive economies. We talk about the issue of whether we can still play catch up on the back of fossil fuels or whether the time for that has passed. Um, and we talk about the just transition and the issues of, of jobs. And then onto renewable energy, whether it's a viable and re potential replacement for our energy needs here in South Africa and the potential to, re to replace coal um, and the different paths and options that we, that we have. Then we go down to, that's the context for, for climate journalism in South Africa. Then we go to some specific suggestions for climate journalism in particular. So again, coming back to this issue of foregrounding the background. Um, I think as journalists and editors, we need to go out of our way to, to look for, for climate news and bring it into the foreground and make sure that it gets a, a higher level of coverage. We need to look at the terminology that we use. Climate change often suggests that climate change is neutral or benign. We need to talk about climate emergency and climate crisis far more often. Natural disaster reporting and reporting on the fossil fuel industry always needs to mention the climate context, even if we're not entirely certain what that precise context might be yet. Um, and then we should need to think imaginatively about integrating, for example, the climate context into weather reporting. Like numbers such as the current global temperature increase, regional temperature increases can be reported alongside weather reports. We've got a case study on best practice from The Guardian, um, which started their climate journey in 2015 by actually divesting from fossil fuels, really taking responsibility there. Um, and then we look at so the flip side of some of these recommendations, some of the, some of the errors that are, are still happening sometimes in our media. We then have a sets of potential contacts for journalists to, to contact from civil society, for, like from universities to talk to, um, and economies who are well versed in the, in the climate issue. And we also have a section called the deeper stories, looking at the underlying causes of and solutions for climate change. So obviously, the leading cause of climate change is our fossil fuel dominated energy system, but there are also other subsidiary causes, um, our extractive agri agricultural model, toxic social dynamics, tattered democracies, a profit led financial services sector. Um, all these issues are unpacked here and we offer a way of looking beyond the headline solutions to some of the deeper solutions. Here David, is our section. The fact that you, you're on 15 minutes. Great, thank you. I'll wrap in a moment. Climate journalism resources, um, an extensive list here. Here are the tables with the lists of contacts. Um, 
including economists who are well versed in climate change and lastly since we're fossil free south africa a section on divestment so what's next um, please we'll ask we'll mention this again at the end but send us feedback on the guide um, if you want us to present on these issues to your colleagues or to students please get in touch look at the guide sign up to our climate beat newsletter and watch the space um, we're just getting started with this work thank you all very much excellent thank you so much david um, there's a request in the chat for us to share the slides and i do believe we would um, share them with everyone who's registered um, so um, that will be done um, and just to say oh, it's always sobering listening to you hearing uh, talking on climate change david it always kind of brings it into stark stark focus so thank you for that um, and yeah great work on the guide itself. And I, I hope everyone will give feedback and, and use the guide as well, all of our esteemed colleagues in the media that have joined us here today. With that, we're going to turn to Lileka Dlamini, who will be talking about the global methane threat, um, something that I think in South Africa is on top of our minds um, in the climate sector, the, the rush for gas that's happening around the country. Um, Lileka is a PhD candidate at UCT and Wageningen. University and is part of the climate lab group um, in the UCT African Climate and Development, Development Initiative. David, if I could just ask you to stop your screen share, maybe you'll go to the holding slide. Um, and otherwise, Luleka, if you can hear us, can we turn to you? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can hear you, yes. Oh, no, sorry, you're on mute again, Nuleka. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for allowing me to share my two thoughts about the current um, debate regarding methane emissions across the, across the world. So basically, methane is... Um, is produced when there is a breakdown of decay or a breakdown or decay of organic materials. It is uh, essentially one of the powerful um, heat trapping greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere. It is um, the second biggest contributor to what we see now. Um, after carbon dioxide. Um, I mean, there are two ways in which we um, production from the wetlands. Um, however, we are contributing 60% in terms of um, the anthropogenic uh, emissions. This includes the high production of beef and dairy um, production. It also can come up um, uh, under um, transportation um, through sewage treatments and plants as well as um, through coal mines, oil wells, and, and gas wells. Um, there has been an annual increase in atmospheric um, methane, uh, particularly between 2020 and 2021. I guess that's where the debate is coming from because we had a lot of people working at home and so forth. But um, for example, in 2021, the, the, the amount of methane in the atmosphere was about 17,000 parts per billion, which is 15% higher than the average between 1984 and 2006. And uh, some of the, the studies that have been conducted are saying this is due to unexpected uh, and complex leakages of gas, as well as the, 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 the ongoing wildfires that are occurring, are occurring at the moment also may be due to, to, to climate change already. Um, in general, the atmosphere does have the ability to remove methane as it has these detergents that are acting as cleaners of, of, of the air. However, with, for example, with the, with the increase in wildfires, these wildfires produce um, carbon monoxide, which then reacts with these um, detergents. So it slows down the actual removal of methane in the atmosphere in, um, instead of the natural a natural way, and hence the, the increase that we're seeing at the moment. Um, there's also a debate between whether we should be focusing on removing methane or uh, just focusing on carbon dioxide. And that's, or the debate is also uh, including the fact that methane only stays in the air for about 
nine to 10 years, whereas carbon dioxide um, stays in the air, in the air um, for, for years. And that's why we're saying whatever we're doing now will, will have an impact in the near future or a thousand of years from now. Um, also, Lekha, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're mm -hmm. currently sharing your slides in presenter view. Is it possible for you to share them um, in presenter mode? It just might be difficult for some people to read them. Um, I think I was presenting them in presenter mode. Um, so I, which screen are you sharing? We can still see the notes and, and everything. Uh, so the slides are okay, moving. let me just switch my, <clears throat> I need to switch my, um, screen to, yeah. Uh, is it better now? Perfect, yes. thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what happened now. Okay, cool. <clears throat> so the, yes, I was saying that the <clears throat> methane itself is, has more power in terms of trapping the heat. However, it, it, the, the, the resident time in the atmosphere is lower compared to um, CO2. So it, CO2 does remain as the primary driver of um, human-induced climate change. With that said, it does not mean that we should not be um, lowering um, our methane emissions because if that goes unchecked, it will even have worse uh, um, implications for our climate altogether. So there is a need to, 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 to reduce the methane production by maybe lowering our beef and dairy production, changing our farming um, practices as well, and also ensuring that we reduce the amount of um, seepages that we see from our, our landfills and our fossil fuel extraction um, processes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Dudeka, and apologies for the, the interruption, but it was great to be able to see that last slide up close. Thanks very much for that um, take on methane and the, the science behind it, very much appreciated. We're now going to um, turn to Leonie Joubert, um, and she will be talking about the importance of narrative journalism in climate reporting. Leonie is one of South Africa's most experienced science, writer, science writers and the author of 10 books, a specialist in climate, food security and pollution, and who's most recently done extensive reporting for National Geographic. And Ulek, if I could just ask you to um, end your screen share just before we switch over to Leonie. But Leonie, if you can hear us, over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to join all of you today. And um, David and Joe, well done on this absolutely essential and incredibly well um, packaged media guide. Um, Luleka, you still, I think, on screen share. Um, uh, I think the invite suggested that I was involved in compiling this uh, guide, and I, in fact, wasn't, as much as I would love to have it on my CV, because I think it's one of the most well-conceptualized uh, um, media guides I've seen. So well done. Um, I'm going to bring in a slightly different angle this morning. Um, there's something that happens with astronauts when they leave Earth's atmosphere and they turn back and they look at Earth and they see the, this pale blue dot um, and they have a, a, a sense of consciousness shifting where they realize that this tiny little dot in space is our only home. This is our home. And uh, this, this awakening actually even has a name. It's called the overview effect. And uh, it's a, a very powerful way to um, remind us uh, where we fit in this planetary system. And uh, it's used widely by environmentalists to, to demonstrate the kind of shift in value system that we need um, as we confront this incredible existential threat. So what does the overview effect and astronauts have to do with journalism? <laughs> Um, human beings have uh, a number of superpowers, and one of those superpowers is storytelling. Um, storytelling is a very uh, potent technology. Um, it's something we've been doing longer than we've even had the written words to tell stories. And this is where journalism fits in to the process of using storytelling to create a collective overview effect. Because obviously we can't all go out into space and experience Earth from a distance. 
Um, storytellers, whether they are fiction writers, non-fiction writers, um, whether it's theater, the visual arts, sculpture, whatever, we all have a way to use the, the power of storytelling to shift consciousness, to change our value systems, and then to change the kind of world we create. So where is journalism within all of this? Um, you know, the fourth estate, it's called the fourth estate for a, a, a fundamental reason. We are, journalism is absolutely central to keeping a healthy society together. Um, our role obviously is to inform and to educate the public. It is to drive active citizen, citizenry. So to get our fellow citizens to realize that this isn't just about showing up at the polling stations every five years, but being engaged every single day in decision-making that affects our lives and communities. Obviously it's about holding government to account as well as the um, very powerful private sector. Um, and because they also shape the world that we live in. Um, and I would argue, and uh, yeah, sorry, I would argue that journalism generally has really failed in its role to warn society about uh, climate collapse. And in fact, I would say that the business media is, uh, is really um, also needs to be held accountable for largely playing a cheerleader to those who play by the rules of the capitalist game, rather than questioning the rules of the game itself. Um, which of course is uh, challenging this predatory capitalist system that allows, um, the, uh, allows pollution to go unaccounted for. So um, that I think is one of the important things that comes through in, in David and Joe's guide is, a, is a, a stronger call for a systems critique from journalism. But um, uh, so where does narrative journalism fit into all of this? Um, Narrative journalism is often seen as an indulgence because it's, it's often quite long. Um, it takes a long time to research. It takes up a lot of space. Um, and obviously it's not suited to certain sort of platforms. But this is why narrative journalism is, is such a powerful tool. Um, and obviously it's, it's only applicable to certain styles of storytelling. You know, if, you, if, you're, if you're writing a hard news piece, it's not appropriate. If you're writing an analysis piece, it's not appropriate. But there is a space for it. And um, uh, this is why narrative journalism can be so powerful. And I guess what most of you will think of as narrative journalism is this call for journalism stories to put a human face to the climate crisis. And <clears throat> essentially what that means is, so human beings have got these mirror neurons in our brains and it's a basic survival mechanism. It's the way we have evolved as a, as a social primate. Um, and basically it means when I see you in your context, when I recognize that you are feeling hunger or fear, when I can see in your face that you're experiencing joy or love or a sense of connection, the mirror neurons in my brain kick in and I start to feel what you feel. That's why putting a human face to a climate story um, can drag someone, yank someone out of their own little echo chamber of experience and allow them to see what this situation context means for another person. And I would argue in this context that we, we need to be doing this not just to put a human face to the story, but in order to shift our value system to, to also reflect in our stories the more than human uh, species that are experiencing climate collapse. I'll give you a little example. One of the stories I did recently for National Geographic was on the African penguin. So the African penguin is the only penguin species indigenous to the African continent. Most of the, the, the habitat is in Namibian and South African waters. And this animal is going to be extinct in the wild in just 15 years. I'll be 65 by then. Uh, that's a blink of an eye in time. And it, I know sometimes when, when so many people around us are struggling with poverty, with hunger, with uh, job insecurity, etc. It's hard to remember or see the value of the African penguin. But the African penguin is not just a cute little animal that inspires soft toys. Um, the value of the animal is not in whether it brings economic re or revenue to the country. Um, this bird is a, a, a keystone predator within our marine ecosystem. 
And if it's dying out, it means that the entire system is on the brink of collapse. And the marine system along our coastline is essential to all of us. It regulates our climate, it brings food onto the table, it gives jobs, and um, it creates biodiversity. Um, it's absolutely essential. So, so the loss of this animal uh, is, is flagging a much bigger systems level collapse. So how do you, how do you put an a, a empathetic, recognizable face onto the story? Um, there was um, a mass evacuation of penguins recently from Bird Island because um, a, about 100 chicks were found starving to death. And the, the story is essentially that the, the parents are going off into the sea looking for food for themselves to fatten up after um, uh, raising the chicks and then to take food back to their chicks. And there just isn't any food. They can't get to the food either because climate changes in the water, temperature changes are moving the fish elsewhere. They're competing with uh, big ships that are uh, disrupting the, the routes and um, they're competing with the fishing industry. So these birds are starving. Now, if we can tell a story that helps the reader understand what it feels like to be that distressed as a parent, because we know what it feels like to feel hunger. We know what it feels like to feel distress uh, around our family. Um, and this is, this is part of the, the broader awakening to drag us out of our own little comfort zone and realize the wider implications that our behavior and our citizenry has on the broader planet. Um, so storytelling is really one of the best ways to do that. Um, I'm gonna wrap up now by just saying that we have a 10 year window in which to radically alter value systems the economy, the politics, the way we do absolutely everything. And we need to be doing it in a way where we're working with each other collaboratively and empathetically. We're not just these individualistic, um, self-seeking individuals in the capitalist system. Human beings are so successful as a social being because we are actually also cooperative. And it's these empathetic brains that make us able to work like that. Some of the stories we have to tell are about the fact that hell, some people are already experiencing hell on earth. Um, millions of people going hungry in Somalia right now. Byra almost wiped off the map, map by Cyclone Ide. Um, this terrible El Nino driven drought across Southern Africa, causing animals to die and people to lose their livelihoods. We have one decade in which to radically, radically alter everything around us. That's 10 birthdays. That's 130 full moons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonie. Thank you for that. Um, we're now gonna turn to the Joanne Smetherin, who is the co-author of the guide with David. So Joanne, over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, just a little comment. Thank you very much, Leonie. I, I so enjoyed what you had to say. I really appreciated it, yeah. Um, just a little note on the guide that it was a very, real collaborative um, effort. We, David and I wrote it, but we got a lot of input from other NPOs and a lot of, lot of input from scientists, all of which we incorporated. Um, and climate change is developing so fast, knowledge of it and also um, reaction, action taken is changing so fast that we can't possibly ourselves keep on top of, of all that's happening. So if any of you see things that need to be included, or if you have comments um, and suggestions, they warmly welcome. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Joanne. So thank you to all of our speakers for your, for your great contributions. We now have about um, 10 minutes for questions and answers. So um, please uh, feel free to uh, put up your hand and we'll call on you. It would be lovely to hear your voice, but you're also welcome to put a question in the chat if you would like, and we'll try and keep track of those as well. Please address it to a specific contributor if you if you can, otherwise we'll, we'll open it to everyone. And a reminder that we will formally close at five minutes to the hour, um, but if you'd like to stay on a bit longer and ask additional questions, you have that opportunity as well. So would anyone like to raise a hand or drop a question in the chat for any of our contributors.
Paoliani, um, thanks for coming off video mute as well. And if you come off mute and ask your question. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so, so, so much for this um, guide. I think it's going to be incredibly useful, not just to journalists, but to documentary filmmakers and fiction filmmakers. Um, I, I work predominantly in the documentary field uh, in impact producing. And I think that this is going to be incredibly useful because the field of impact producing is all about designing strategies that get the right messages to the right people in the right ways to effect change. And this is going to help us to get the messages on track and to make sure that we're communicating in the right way. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, thank you, Leonie. Maxine, you have your hand up. Um, and just, uh, I should have mentioned it earlier, but please try and keep your um, questions to about 30 seconds if possible, just so we can get everyone a chance. But over to you, Maxine. Um, thank you so much um, for arranging this and for the guide. Um, you know, I was I was thinking about like uh, how how do we how do we get it through to people who don't really care about climate change, you know? And um, I thought about um, a few years ago when the city of Cape Town was going through a drought, and the city kept um, giving out press releases and saying you you need to reduce your water usage and whatever. And, like it just wasn't changing. But then um, when they started talking about day zero by March, we won't have water and whatever, like people then immediately started changing the, the, the <clears throat> habits. Um, so I think this guide will also like really help in that sense, you know, um, in how to bring out the urgency and how to make people see that this is affecting me as well, you know, tell the stories and yeah. So thank you for that. Great, thank you, Maxine. Mickey, you have your hand up. Ah, uh, yes, just to echo a huge thank you. Um, and to say, I mean, this is a question I don't direct it to anyone specific, so whoever would like to jump in. Something that I grapple with, often when you do read journalism um, articles and you hear stories that, that are linked to climate action, climate crisis, it, it's sometimes so overwhelming that it becomes debilitating. And how does one make it such, make that communication land so that people feel empowered to take action and to address the situation. Thanks, David, would you like to, is that a, an answer to that question? Go ahead. Yes, Mickey, thanks. I think you're, you're absolutely right that it can be disempowering. And I think one of the, the things that we need to communicate again and again and again is that climate change is just one manifestation of a, of, a, of a set of human systems that are causing us problems in many different realms. There is a link between the poverty and inequality and the corruption that is the major preoccupation of our media in South Africa and climate change. And that link is the nature of our economic and social systems. And, and, and if we can start to unpack that, if we can start to see that in, in fixing the climate problem, we can also start to address these other problems that have been with us for so long, then I think that can be empowering. Um, we can, when we start to have a more decentralized energy economy that more people can benefit from, for example, when we start to have more human centric agriculture that, that restores the, the sort of dignity and the role of, of human beings in our, in our food production, that can be empowering. Um, so I think there, there, there are many ways in which we've become, there's, there's a Buddhist saying that if those who spend too long in a privy or a toilet uh, soon forget the smell, I think we've become too accustomed to the many problems that come with, with the use of fossil fuels, not just climate change, but also air pollution, land and water degradation, um, and, all, and all these other issues. And when we start to, to really seriously address the climate issue, we're going to, to create many opportunities for strengthening our society in ways that we didn't expect. So I'll, I'll leave it at that for now, but thank you. Yeah, I think Leonie, you wanted to add to that. Yes, yeah. thank you. Um, there's a, a big emerging new beat called solutions journalism. And this is, um, there's a, also a very strong sort of psychological um, foundation for why solutions journalism is important. So in terms of being effective in um, communicating around this difficult uh, and 
terrifying topic. It's very clear that you need a balance between um, saying how bad it is, but then giving people a sense of agency within their lives and their communities so that they don't feel so paralyzed with overwhelm. And solutions journalism is not about Pollyanna thinking, silver lining thinking. It's about within the context of this story and this audience in this community, what is the solution to this problem? And uh, reporting that, that gives people a, a, an ability to find and think about their own solutions and pointing them to what works can allow them to feel that they can actually do something even though it's so dire. Thanks, Leonie. Um, Matthew, I see you have your hand up and there's also a question from Anke in the chat. And I'm gonna ask um, the panelists just to take, pay attention to that and I'll give you an opportunity to maybe speak to that um, and possibly Matthew's question as well. So Matthew, over to you. And then we'll close it there because we're, we're nearly at time. So over to you, Matthew. Thanks very much, Glenn. And thanks to all the speakers. My, my questions uh, um, cuts across a lot of the, the presentation today, but it's specifically for Leonie, I think, the call for um, us to, as, as Glenn said, Exar's presentation, to stay with climate news every day, right? And I think that's obviously a very important part of this. Um, how do you think that, oh, and I also think it's extremely important, and uh, as we've noted today, to make, to give it a human face, climate, the climate crisis, but also to have not only journalists, but also average people, normal people, to write and write their own experiences. Because as, as David was saying, also connecting climate crisis and the science of climate crisis, et cetera, to the human, the very everyday. So what, what role do you think this guide can play? And if any, and I'm sure it can, um, for connecting average people to and getting their stories onto these onto these sites, into these forums. I think, yeah, just speaking to that. Thanks, Tony. Thanks very much, Matthew. So would anyone like to reply to Matthew's question? Any of our panelists? getting ordinary people involved? Um, I mean, I can Leonie? do, but, but I think I've spoken enough. So maybe someone else wants to go. Please, please go, go ahead, ahead. Leonie. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, okay. yeah. So, you know, we often hear about, um, about citizen journalism and citizens and science, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I think it is, it's wonderful and it's essential to create this bigger weave. Um, I think that the challenge is to um, find ways to draw in storytellers because not everyone has learned the actual skills um, to find ways to, to um, enable and facilitate people to become storytellers. And at the same time, I think we as journalists need to become activists within our newsrooms, whether you're a freelancer or in a newsroom to, to lobby and, and, and motivate to our editors to A, make the story touch every single beat, and B, create platforms to allow the citizen journalist to tell that story. Um, but storytelling is actually quite a craft, quite a, a skill. And I mean, I've been doing it for 25 years and I only feel as though I'm now learning how to do it. So it's lovely to have stories come in, but sometimes I think you need professional storytellers to help um, someone tell the story in a way that is suited to a platform. Thanks, Leonie. Um, Joanne, I saw you come off mute. Did you want to add there? Yes, I just wanted to add to bring in what Tando was saying about the many people, right at the beginning, Tando was talking about the many people, many activists working all over South Africa, all over the world, really, doing work that what is what that is the solutions journalism that Leonie was talking about, who creating the solutions and who passionate about these things. And perhaps if we were to feature those people and their work and the, their challenges and um, the things they're coming up with, then we might evoke some of that mirror, <laughs> those mirror neurons that Leonie was talking about and kind of spread that, um, spread that fire. So for me, it's a, a little reminder to look out for those people, those many people. Thanks, Joanne. And David, I did see you um, took a uh, stab at answering Anke's um, question in the chat, but I wondered, I did mention that we'd come to it. So I wondered if anybody of the panelists wanted to say something um, further about that live, and then we'll, we'll wrap up after that.
Um, I just I would just say that if if you take a look at the guide and take a look at some of the underlying where we, we, we unpack the underlying causes of climate change, I think that section of the guide gives you a, a sort of way of unpacking accountability for this crisis, and we can use that um, that section to hopefully illuminate some of the causes. I mean, I like to say often that we we um, we overestimate the role that technology has to to play in in resolving this crisis. Technology, of course, is absolutely essential. We need to change the, the fundamental energy technology that is is driving our world, and need to make, move to sustainable forms of energy. But the actual blockage, the reason why we're not implementing that technology at the at the speed that we need to at the moment, is because of really a lack of democracy in, in many instances. And so the, the, the real technology that we need to solve this crisis is, is human technology, social technology. We need informed, empowered, active citizens who are lobbying for the changes that we need in our energy system and in other parts of our economy to really push for these, these changes at the speed that we need. We need people who need to know the, 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 these issues inside out, working very hard and very fast on, on them. I hope that helps a bit. Thank you, David. So that brings us to the end. Thanks to, for all of you who have stayed so long. Um, David did put in the chat, and maybe David, you could just drop it in again so it's fresh for everyone, some ways to engage with us beyond this conversation. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, if you would like to engage with any of the presenters, we will stay on after the end of the call if you'd like to ask additional questions. Um, but thank you again so much. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to David to just uh, wrap us up with some closing remarks. Thanks, David. Great. Well, thank you again very much, everyone, for, for attending today. We really appreciate your, your engagement. I think uh, hopefully it's, it's clear that the, the phrase climate emergency is not just a phrase or a slogan. It's a real messy, unpredictable, accelerating global crisis that faces us all. It's making all our existing problems worse, but conversely, as we've said, fixing it can help solve many of those existing problems. Again, the costs of using fossil fuels are now orders of magnitude more damaging than the utility of the profits from their use. Given the guaranteed damage of the large scale extraction and sale of fossil fuels that is now tantamount to an act of, of mass human sacrifice. We can't wait until 2050 or 2040 to stop things getting far worse. We have to cut global greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2030. And I know that sounds impossible right, right now. But every South African citizen needs to understand all this, and the media has a huge role to play in ensuring that they do. Thank you again very much, everyone. So, as, as we said, you're most welcome to stay on if you, you have further questions at this point. Um, but feel, feel free to leave if you need to. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, if anyone is staying on and would like to ask additional press, uh, questions, perhaps you can continue to drop them in the chat if you would like. And again, encourage you, if you can, to come off mute and ask your questions live. I think that would yeah. be great. Yanni, over to you. I think you had your, your hand up. First, but I, I have had an opportunity to speak, so maybe Jackie should go first. Go for it, Jackie. Hi, um, so I'm new to all of this. I'm recent. I'm a social worker by training, a mom of three kids, and absolutely devastated by all of this. So I've recently joined um, an activist group called Extinction Rebellion, and I've been with them since about March. Um, and I was just wondering if there was advice you would give to activist groups in engaging with media and how we can be more effective. Um, yeah, any, any thoughts around that? Because I feel like there are people who are wanting to, to be those citizen activists, but um, we didn't have much training. We have some people in the, in the movement who have journalist experience, but a lot of us are just ordinary people. So we'd love some thoughts on that. Thanks, Jackie. David, would you like to? Yes, sure, Jackie. I, th I think that's a very good point, actually. Um, and I mean, we've 
we are activists ourselves, but we've also been approaching this very much as journalists. Um, I think one key point is is kind of understanding the, the pressures that journalists are very often under, and it's and it's understanding those pressures in a way that's driven us to create this this guide to try and make it easier for journalists to do a good job, because we know that most journalists really want to do a good job uh, of reporting these issues, but there are significant structural and historic constraints on them, making it making it hard. So, um, I think understanding. You know the, the pressures that journalists are under, trying to get journalists accurate information, comprehensive information in, in a neatly packaged form, um, trying to understand that journalists need to sell their stories to editors very often, and trying to to find ways of making them interesting or or unique. Um, yeah, that can that can be helpful. Um, but maybe there's a, there's maybe there's an additional section that we need to to add to the guide, which is um, how to how to make things easier for journalists. And yeah, thank you for your question. I hope that helps a bit. Thanks, David. I did just want to come back to a corner's question that you asked in the chat, and apologies, a corner, I, I missed it earlier as you we were ending off. Um, but she asked the question, how do journalists get readers to discern between real climate crisis stories versus greenwashing stories spewed out by the fossil fuel industry? Um, uh, it's a tricky question, but I wonder if anyone had insights into that. I'll take a quick stab at that. Um, and I think really the key thing is is people need to know more. The, these things are complex. And sometimes you will have a, a, a company that is doing good things and bad things at the same time. And to really understand what is good and what is bad, you have to understand the balance between those things. Um, so Sassel, for example, does do some renewable energy. Um, it does have research money going into renewable energy. Unfortunately, that that and that research might well pay off at a, at a, at a, at a if it was scaled up. Unfortunately, at the moment, it's vastly the value of that research is vastly outweighed by by their continued large scale emissions. And often, the way that fossil fuel industry greenwashing works is that they look at the good parts of their operations, which are the very small parts. And they expand those massively in their marketing and then just ignore all the, all the bad stuff. Um, it's a very simple formula. And I think it's quite easy to communicate that formula to the public so that they can see how that's working. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm not seeing any other. Um... Leonie, do you want to reply to this? Because there is another question. Do you, you yeah, just on? very briefly, I think also to, to answer Corner's question, you know, I, um, it is sometimes very difficult to, to drill down really deeply to know what's true and what's not true and what's fuzzy. And I think one of the most important things you can have is a, is a, a list of experts who are uh, critical thinkers, who are well-informed in a subject, who when you get stuck, you can phone them and say, help me understand these figures, help me understand these claims. Um, the more perspectives you have, the better you can become at picking out what you can believe and what you shouldn't. Um, but it requires years of networking and, and yeah, just building up those, those experts that you can call on. Great. Just a reminder that we've started to build those lists at the, at, the, at the end of the guide. So if you, as a journalist, you need to find the right people to talk to, um, those lists are there and, and we're going to expand them. Thanks. Um, Liani, you um, had a follow-up question. Can I, you did ask it to me in the chat, but if I can ask you to say it out loud, it's always nice to hear different voices. Oh, thank you. Um, Leone answered the question that I posed before. Uh, wonderfully, thank you, Leonie. And I just wanted to ask whether any of the other panelists had a call to action that, that we as creatives can amplify to the general public, possibly something that can tell us what we can do as ordinary people to put pressure on policymakers to make an actual change. Tundo, do you perhaps have a want to take a stab at that? I think Tundo left the call. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, yeah. um, Joanne, do you, did you want to say something? You, you're muted, Joanne. We can't hear you. 
newsrooms need to think of clever journalists and news editors need to think of clever ways of packaging climate change so that people can feel it, um, digest it and make a difference. And I don't know what those are. Um, when someone was previously talking about day zero, that was such a clear little um, graspable caption. And climate breakdown means everything falling apart. It's so huge. Uh, people have talked about how, how overwhelming it is. So how do we how do we make campaigns that are graspable and that people can do something about and that um, yeah, and that people can care about? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I think that's the challenge. And yeah, somehow we need slogans or we need captions or we need calls to action. We need to somehow encapsulate, encapsulate it. The guide that can't do that. The guide is background. The guide is kind of a platform to make it easier for people to do that. So I really don't have the answer, but I think it's an excellent question. And until, um, until we can fi find ways of approaching that in a creative way that people can, get, can kind of latch onto, I think it's going to be carry on being a huge challenge to make climate journalism mainstream. I, I can add to that. Um, I mean, I think one of the, the, the key ways is, I mean, we don't have in, in many ways a, a particularly strong representative democracy. It's very hard in South Africa to go and talk to your MP because it's next to impossible to find out who your representative MP is. But I think what we do need to do increasingly is to speak to politicians, whether it's at, at a local government level or a national government level, whether whatever party they're from, speak to politicians, tell them that these, these issues are important to you. Speak to people of influence in business. We don't have visible climate leadership in South Africa. We don't have CEOs who are standing up and saying, these issues are of critical importance to the future of this country and we can't afford to neglect them anymore. Um, we don't have that kind of visible social leadership. Um, and to the extent that we have leadership from within government, it's very often ambiguous. We have one department saying wanting to do one thing and another department, I'm sure I don't need to spell out which departments I'm referring to, um, going in a completely different di direction. So we really need that, that high level visible social leadership from politicians of all parties, um, from, and from social leaders, from priests, from teachers, from principals, from university, um, vice chancellors, we need far more of, of that kind of, of leadership. Um, ordinary people in positions of influence standing up and telling everybody else that they take these issues seriously and, and, and we all need to, to work on, together on them. Does that go some way, Liani, towards answering your question? Um, yes, it certainly does. It certainly does. And I think that um, bringing together Leonie's suggestions about um, accessing individual audiences through emotion and knowing who it is that we need to speak to, that, that's the key to getting messages across. And like literally, literary journalism, <laughs> um, film and television are incredibly powerful platforms to reach audiences. In South Africa, more than 50% of the population, well, that was a 2015 study, um, still con uh, consume content on um, terrestrial broadcasts. So SABC and ETV are incredibly powerful. The, you know, there are millions of people watching soap operas. How do we get climate change messages into those spaces? And just as a note, trying, when we were trying to send out invitations for this guide, the, the broadcast media are the most inaccessible and to, to try and reach. It's almost impossible to find out how to reach people in those, in those forums and in those institutions. Leonie, you had your hand up patiently. Thanks. So, so I wanted to just, uh, you know, Leonie, your question is so difficult to answer in such a short space, but um, what I think has to become central in the, what we communicate is the power dynamics within society that allows um, this mass pollution, polluting of the atmosphere. So what we need to show the world is that particularly these really big multinationals have often have more power over our political system than we as the voting public do. And I think that's what comes through well in George Monbiot's writing. Um, obviously, you know, each one of us as a storyteller in a different genre have to figure out how we apply our unique skills to telling that story. But I mean, a, a brief comparison would be if you look at the multinational food industry and big sugar, um, 
a lot of these multinationals have way, way, way more power to shape the, a country level policy around food and sugar than the voting public do. And the voting public often doesn't know that. So let's say um, uh, McDonald's wants to move into Mozambique uh, or Lesotho and get access to new markets. The government's um, policy makers have, uh, are very, very easily kind of overwhelmed by the legal potency of this multinational. So if we can show those power dynamics, which are often invisible to ordinary people, you know, we need to move away from selling this narrative that a few well-meaning individuals are going to clean up beach pollution, you know, recycle, not drive so much. That's not how we change the system. We need to educate people about how the system works. So if we as storytellers can understand how the system works, and then we take our own unique skill as a storyteller, whether you're writing a soap, option, a soap opera script or whether you're writing a, a, a novel, um, find a way to use your unique skill to then inform your reader or your viewer about the injustice of this predatory capitalist system. No easy task. <laughs> Thanks, Leonie. I'm not seeing any further hands or questions at the moment. Um, so Luleka, thank you again very much for participating. Um, are there any other last questions or points that people would like to raise um, before we close? Liani, thanks for sharing your, your Story Lab link. That's fantastic. We'll um, be in touch. <laughs> <laughs> now that we've met you and we have your contact details. <laughs> thanks again. Thank you again, Liani. Okay, I'm not seeing any further questions. So at this point, I think we can close the meeting, um, but we will definitely be hearing from us again. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely day and a great weekend. And let's cut global emissions 50% by 2030 somehow. <laughs> Cheerio, everyone. Thank you.